And good afternoon. We're here with uh, MP Stephen Lloyd for Eastbourne and Willingdon. How are you today, Stephen? Very good, very good. Nice to have the sun out. It is, isn't it? And thank you for taking the time to talk to us. We've got lots and lots of questions to ask you, um, but we won't keep you too long, so don't worry. Uh, first, we really wanted to talk about Brexit. Okay? We, at the moment, we have a big situation where uh, Boris Johnson uh, has resigned from the Cabinet, as well as David Davis. Now, how is that affecting things in the House right now? It's a very febrile situation. Uh, a lot of the Tories are, are walking around ever, ever slightly like uh, headless chickens. I mean, the interesting thing is, uh, my hunch actually is Theresa May strengthened her position, funny enough, and I'll tell you why. Um, for there to be a leadership fight within the Conservatives, 48 letters need to go into something called the 1922 Committee. And that might be doable, uh, but then what would happen is that would trigger a leadership election, and for that to happen, over 150 Conservative MPs need to not vote for Theresa May. Uh, within there, the, the mood really, other than the fact the Tories are all looking a bit stricken, is that actually we think Theresa May well, may well have pulled this off. Uh, I think Boris looked an idiot going after David Davies. Only Boris Johnson would commission a photographer to take a photo of him signing the resignation letter. I mean, the absolute contempt the man has held within Parliament across the party, and I mean with a lot of Conservative MPs, is exemplified with that. Um, so, I'd, funnily enough, though the media initially is saying this is a crisis for the Prime Minister, and I'm not fussed, I'm a Lib Dem MP, I'm not a Tory, um, I actually think she just may well finally have played quite a good hand. Uh, the key two things that happen now, from her perspective and from the government's perspective, is she has to keep her nerve, because there will be 60 or 70 vehement right-wing, vehement Brexiters who will be putting as much pressure on her uh, to actually water down the agreement that the Cabinet came up with uh, on Friday. If she keeps her nerve on that, my view, and the view of others within Westminster, is, is actually she will be strong enough to see them off. The second thing is, is the EU has to uh, be, in my view, sensible and, pro and productive with Theresa May on what was decided at the weekend. If they then kick off and say, it's not good enough, take it all away, then I think the whole thing will fall apart and there could well be that early general election that some people are talking about. Without that, um, she may actually have strengthened her hand. So we'll wait and see. Every day at the minute, it's, uh, it's a very fluid situation. Absolutely. Hourly by, hour by hour, it changes. Um, yeah, I mean, this time yesterday, everyone thought that there could well be a leadership challenge until, what, half past six or something when the 1922 committee did meet. Now, it's interesting that you say 150 Conservatives have to vote against her. In the House, that is, isn't it? Is that for a, mo a motion of no confidence? No, what that would be is, uh, from a Conservative leadership perspective, 48 letters have to go into something called the 1922 Committee to trigger a ballot. Uh, the ballot can then be held within 24 hours of that, and then a majority of Tory MPs, so I think it'll be 155, then have to vote against Theresa May as Prime Minister. My reading, and the reading of a lot of uh, uh, cross-party colleagues within Westminster, is that the hard Brexiters have about maybe 70, maybe as high as 80, but no more than that. So, I mean, for a while, uh, Theresa May's uh, leadership has been appalling. She's a very cautious individual. To be honest, a sort of female version of Gordon Brown in many ways. She's that cautious. But I think over the weekend uh, and from the meeting that the Cabinet had in, uh, on Friday, uh, my view, and a view of a lot of others, is that she's now finally digging in and facing them down. I personally think that's a good thing, and the reason being, I mean, I don't agree with Brexit, but uh, uh, if we are going to have it, I would much rather that we have a sensible Brexit that allows businesses to thrive if we have a crash-out Brexit. My fear for the economy and for the United Kingdom PLC, I think, would be absolutely catastrophic. In fact, funny enough, I just asked a question in Westminster, literally, 20 minutes ago, um, one of the consequences of a complete crash-out Brexit is that it means, as the Brexiters say, you could have uh, um, a trade deal with America around uh, agricultural products. Let's think this through, you see, that sounds good. But actually, Theresa May, to be fair, finally has realised that if you have a free trade agreement around agriculture with America, 
then that means you've got to accept chlorinated chicken, you've got to accept GM food, you've got to accept an awful lot of things that the Brits around here, we don't want. So actually part of the, one of the outcomes of the cabinet meeting on Friday with coming to a conclusion of a softer Brexit, I would say a more sensible Brexit, is actually there won't be any danger of uh, uh, agriculture deals with America that will entail exactly the kind of things you're talking about. I asked a question about it in the House today just to remind people, because the Brexiters out there, the vehement Brexiters, they, they, A, they haven't come up with a plan in two years. They've just jumped up and down and said, we want to leave, we want to leave, we want to leave. We live in a rules-based economy. If you want to live in a country which is not rules-based, move to Russia. And, and you will know what it's like. With all its clunkiness and all its difficulties, we live in a rules-based, liberal, democratic country. And my God, our children, our parents, our family are grateful for that. And a consequence of rules-based is you follow the rules. So if we do leave, and it, you know, that was the result from the referendum, if we do leave Brexit, then I believe we have to do it in a way that actually means that we can still be part of the rules. Because if we just walk away, A, it doesn't work, B, we could be breaking the very fabric of which the whole of the Western world uh, subscribes to. So it's time that the, 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 the angry Brexiters who, frankly, either don't know all the detail or choose not to believe the detail, need to understand the consequences of a crash-out Brexit. I think it would be a catastrophe for the country. Absolutely. Uh, I see what you're saying. And I think it's also interesting that, as you say, the hard-line Brexiteers just assume that going back to the World Trade, Trade Organization rules is a panacea and will actually serve us well. But from what you're saying, there is the complications exactly and implications. Absolutely. It certainly won't. It's far more complicated than that. And the American example, you know, I've, I've just given, if you want chlorinated chicken, you want GM food, you want some of the other things that we and our European allies don't want in this country, then, you know, think very, very hard about which sort of Brexit you're supporting. What I do see within the Conservative Party up here is that uh, the majority of MPs, though I think they accept the, the result of the referendum, um, they recognise that uh, uh, just crashing out would be, really would be a disaster, you know, from such a, so many areas I could barely list them. Yes. And the other thing that's interesting about the weekend is a number of notable Brexiteers like Michael Gove, Andrea Ledson and others, Liam Fox, have actually stayed with the agreement that was thrashed out on Friday. So uh, it does look very, very febrile at the minute and you never predict anything in politics, particularly at the minute. But my view is that actually if Theresa holds her nerve, then I think paradoxically she could be in a stronger position next week than she has been for the last 12 months. We'll wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and one final question on that. Do you think that perhaps this is a ploy, that now that, uh, of course it's a, some sort of ploy, but whether, because Boris Johnson uh, and David Davis are now outside of collective responsibility of the Cabinet, that they can spend the summer now building their own views and their own public opinion, and to come back, obviously, come September, October? Yeah, yeah. I think they probably will. Well, certainly Boris will. Um, one of the things I find interesting since I've been re-elected, because your viewers may not know, I was the MP 2010-2015, lost 2015, then won it back in 2017. It's only when I got elected the last year or so that I've, I've identified just how unpopular Boris is with the majority of his Conservative colleagues. I didn't realise that because no matter how many newspapers you read or how much you, you go online, BBC online or whatever, you never really know unless you're in the bubble. So being inside the bubble, I've been struck uh, by just how unpopular the man is himself. And I don't think there's that strength of support at all amongst the Tory MPs that, that would uh, uh, push him up the job he so desperately craves. Now, that doesn't mean he won't be difficult and it doesn't mean he won't try. But I, 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 I have... And the reason I mention that is the Tory leadership works, that if you have a leadership battle, um, the top two go through to the membership. There'll be five or six candidates. That'll be whittled down to two. They then go to the membership. I can't see in a million years Boris being one of those two. I actually think he's a busted flush. Yeah. And I think the manner of his resignation, where on Friday he said to Theresa May, allegedly at Chequers, according to you guys, the media, uh, that, that though he didn't like the whole plan, he would get behind her. And then 
within hours of David Davies leaving, Boris suddenly leaking and briefing all over the place that he's leaving, and then to have the photographer into the Foreign Office to see him signing a letter, you know, without sounding obviously political, because this isn't, this is, is more than that, Boris Johnson is not admired by a lot of the Tories in Westminster, and I see that from my own eyes. What impact could this have for Eastbourne? Do you, do you, do you see Brexit being change, changing and having a different impact for Eastbourne? Should the citizens of Eastbourne be concerned about the, these I mean, changes? No one knows for sure is the honest answer, and, and people on either side of the divide who tell you with absolute certainty this is going to happen, no one knows because it's a hypothesis. I mean, I, I'm a Remainer. Uh, I was in business for many, many years before I went into politics. I'm not a Remainer because I believe the EU is perfect. It isn't. I'm a Remainer because it's 48% of our economy, you know, of our trade, sorry. It's just absolutely huge. Uh, I argued forcefully during the referendum for uh, people to vote Remain, and I'm still a Remainer. Uh, however, during the referendum, I was also asked directly, people, a lot of people know me in Eastbourne, uh, and even if they disagree with me, they know that... Uh, I'm a man of my word, and I was asked in a number of very big public debates if the referendum went against Remain, um, uh, would I respect the results of the referendum? And I made it crystal clear during the referendum that in respect for my own views, I will respect the results of the referendum, and I won't call for a second referendum. Now, to be honest, when I said that, I thought Remain was going to win. But by the same token, in exactly the same way with university tuition fees, I went against my party on that because I made a promise to my town. Uh, so I'm not going to break that promise. I'm under a lot of pressure, as you can imagine, you know, from my own party. Uh, and I respect that. I do understand that. But uh, I've made it clear to them, and they know me, and they know my uh, relationship with Eastbourne, that in respect to my own personal views, if I make a promise, I won't budge. Uh, now, having said that, in the process, I'm working as hard as I can to get as sensible a Brexit as possible. Um, uh, uh, because we are where we are, uh, but I, I personally feel profoundly that if we had a crash out Brexit, you know, I, I'm, I don't indulge in fear mongering. Your, your listeners and viewers know that. It's not me. But just for someone with 30 years' experience in business, if we have a crash out Brexit, I've already talked about the farm consequences with America, uh, I think the economic outcome would just be catastrophic for this nation. I really do. Uh, so I've been pushing as hard as I can for a soft Brexit within Parliament uh, and beyond. Uh, however, ultimately, uh, I, I'm going to keep my word. It's, it's, it's easy to keep your word when it's easy. Yes. The hard part is to keep your promise when it's difficult. And I will never, ever break a promise I make to Eastbourne, and that's the end of it. Tom Watson from Labour this morning was saying how they're not calling for a second referendum anymore. They were a bit sort of nebulous, I think, on whether they would or not. Uh, but what they're looking for is a meaningful vote in Parliament based on the deal uh, and things like that. Do you think that that is what Eastbourne wants to see? And how do you feel about that personally? I abstained on that. Uh, I understand the argument for meaningful vote totally. And it's actually, to be fair, the Lib Dems have been leading on that. Um, but now I'm afraid I, I couldn't support that because that would be a direct breach of my promise. Um, uh, so it's a challenging time. Challenging time for me, but forget about me. It's far more challenging for the rest. As for Eastbourne, Eastbourne, it's going well. It really is. I love the town. I'm all over it. I'm very pro-business, uh, very pro-Eastbourne. And the affection I've got for the town and the effort I put into the town to get through the next few years will just not rest at all. We've got the Arndale regeneration, 85 million quid town centre regeneration opening on in September. There's no other seaside town in the country that's got that. And it's private money. It's not public money. Private money. We've got the council with the £45 million investment on the conference facilities. The buzz in Eastbourne's good. And it's good because we're a community town. We actually like where we live. We love where we live. We've got a great sense of community looking after our neighbours. And, and my job is to keep that, that sense of community and keep that sense of optimism that I think Eastbourne has. And my passion and my commitment as Eastbourne's MP, it always was, is, is the town's my priority and that's what I do. Um, we will get through Brexit one way or the other. We just will. Uh, but meanwhile, while the rest of the world goes slightly bonkers, you know, with Johnson resigning, with Donald Trump coming here and, 
and all the challenges that uh, uh, Theresa May has with her split cabinet. Uh, I've got a cunning plan for each one. Dead, tell us all. OK, keep it quiet. With you and I, OK? <laughs> Dead, tell us all here. Uh, things are going so well in Eastbourne. I want to keep that sense of community and sense of engagement and the whole positive approach. So my cunning plan is I'm going to build a wall around Eastbourne. You heard it here, folks, first. You're allowed in. <laughs> Another question that I wanted to ask you about, Mr Lloyd, was Gosport at the Gosport Hospital. You've been campaigning for a long time for a local issue there. Can you tell us more about that? I will. It's actually near Portsmouth, which is way outside my constituency. But uh, again, your viewers will have seen a few weeks ago, there was an enormous media storm uh, where a guy called Bishop Jones uh, commit, uh, published a report into the Gosport War Memorial NHS Hospital. And it was absolutely shocking. The conclusion was 400, at least 456 people uh, had died uh, from an inappropriate use of opiates. Well, to be honest, I've been out of the media and said that means 456 people were unlawfully killed. You know, all this sort of fine-tuned language. People understand that means they were unlawfully killed. It came to me because 10 years ago, one of my constituents, Mrs Gillian McKenzie, um, came to me with a story about her mother, her elderly mother, had gone into Gosport War Memorial Hospital 10 years previous, perfectly elderly, but not terminally ill, died within a matter of days. Uh, Mrs McKenzie came to me with real concerns. Frankly, she was saying, Stephen, I believe my mum was bumped off. Now, the honest truth, at first, I found that pretty hard to believe, you know, but I said, well, give me the papers. I spent the weekend reading, you know, a box of papers and came to the conclusion uh, that certainly there was a chance that not only was Mrs McKenzie, could she be right, but a possibility that others were affected as well. So I spent 10 years campaigning on her behalf, as did other relatives, uh, getting nowhere. You know, the NHS batted back, the police did a couple inquiries, very cursory, this is Hampshire Police, nothing to find. The doctor concerned, a, a doctor called Jane Barton, was finally... Uh, taken in front of the General Medical Council and it was found that she oversaw a regime where inappropriate use of opiates uh, and yet she wasn't even struck off. So uh, anyway, cutting a long story short, a few years ago I went to a colleague of mine, Norman Lamb, uh, who was then the health minister in the coalition. He also understood it and he spent a few years pushing and pushing and pushing a few weeks before the 2015 election, where the, co where the Liberals were wiped out, we had started this Bishop's Commission. And he reported only a few weeks ago, and the, and the result is worse even than I feared. As I say, at least 456 people unlawfully killed from this one ward. One ward. Uh, what I'm now... I mean, I'm glad the relatives have got the truth, and they've been waiting for it for years. You know, I think it's been an institutional cover-up, frankly. So I'm glad the truth is out there. What I'm now demanding, and absolutely demanding, is I won't let the government uh, say this is enough. I now want a criminal inquiry into all of those named individuals from that report. I want to see them in court so that they have to take responsibility for their actions and, if necessary, prove their innocence. So the next stage is criminal inquiry. I'm pushing for it virtually every day in Westminster at the minute. And I'm simply not going to allow the government to kick this one into the long grass. Do you actually think that there is a, a, some criminal culpability for the individuals then, rather than it being a policy of the NHS Trust that runs that hospital? I believe it is. I'm as strong as that. I genuinely believe there were some individuals that they have criminal responsibility. I think it was an absolute disgrace. And I'm determined that they get their day in court.